So three more papers for this uh, first session, and I give the word to Sven's speaker, who were so uh, <laughs> yeah, and so great that uh, uh, took the responsibility of chairing this session. So I thank you now for this as well. All right. Once everybody is uh, seated again, um, I'm. Hi. Very happy to be able to introduce Sarah Halet. Um, she's a professional archivist who works at the Tate in London. Um, she joined um, Tate in June 2018, having previously worked um, uh, in other areas and places. Um, she uh, has done multiple exhibitions and research rooted in the relationship between archival and curatorial theory and is interested in the question how beyond a culture of compliance, Tate's record keeping can be more intuitive to research and collecting practices. Um, she's very interested in sites of archival creation and intention and how these are represented yeah. in, artist, in artistic practice and in um, the contemporary art field. So I'd like to hand over to uh, Sarah with a uh, presentation entitled Beyond an Archival Impulse, Re-examining the Artist Archive at Tate in London. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to present the current discussions we've held as part of the reshaping the collectible when artworks live in the museum project. Um, as part of this three-year project, the, this case study, the third of six, is looking at the boundaries and tensions between artworks, records, and archives at Tate. As any museum archivist will tell you, as a repository, the museum archive is set apart from other institutional archives in both principle and practice. They are more likely to hold challenging, non-traditional material and items that have no other place in the museum. This may be felt more so in the archives of an art museum when material moves through the collections as collecting practices evolve and the parameters of value change. Using Foster's definition of the archival impulse as a starting point, I will use a selection of artworks from Tate's collection that demonstrate a new type of archive and archival art entering the collections, a new artist as archivist. These are works that embody the idea of the active archive and are challenging the museum and the archivist to be more flexible and reactive to other interpretations of the archive. This impulse existed long before Foster put a name to it. In practice, Eugene Arger described himself as an archivist. At 25, Duchamp withdrew from painting and into the archives to train at the Bibliothèque saint Geneviève. His ready-mades drew from what Foster refers to as the archives of mass culture, and later his Le Bon en Release pieces became his own portable archives. Oh boy. Um, making up the backbone of the archive at the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, Warhol's time capsules are a great example of the museum archive holding non-traditional material that troubles not only archival practices and the ideas of value, but the boundaries between artwork, record, and archive. His exhibition, Raid the Icebox, at the Rhode Island School of Design in 1969, was a precursor for exhibitions such as The Desire of the Museum at the Whitney in 1989, Deep Storage at MoMA in 1998, and The Museum as Muse at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1999. These exhibitions established a form for archival art and exhibition making that looked familiar. They are about order and collecting, inventories of material that play to a human desire for knowledge and discovery, and a desire to enter the strong room. They speak to a strong human inclination for capturing and preserving memory. Um, in an archival impulse, Foster positioned the artist as archivist as a contemporary mode of practice, using examples by Thomas Harshon, Sam Durant, and Tacita Dean, as artists who seek to make historical information often lost or displaced physically present. We can see this in Bernd and Hiller Birchett's photographs, which echo Archer, and Susan Hiller's dedicated to the unknown artist. Um, Hiller's from the Freud Museum speaks through Foucault's archival lens, where the archive becomes a construction of relational statements. We also see this in Mark Dion's Thames Dig, where, where archaeological material has been dug up from the riverbed of the Thames at, both sites, at sites of both the Tate Modern and the Tate Britain and recategorized and presented in vitrines that invoke memories of old libraries and archives and for some cabinets of curiosities. 
Foster's discussion of Hastert Dean's practice speaks to that of the artist as archivist in a Derridian manner, where traces and memories serve as metaphors for the archive, and archival research propels the work into an archive in and of itself. This speaks to his other point about artists being drawn to unfulfilled beginnings or incomplete products that might offer points of departure again, and sources that are retrieved in a gesture of alternative knowledge or counter-memory. I find these two points particularly interesting as they talk to a period of change in archival theory that runs parallel to an ontological shift that saw the archive move from repository to metaphor <coughs> and later to medium. First articulated in 2001, the postmodern archival paradigm saw the archivist move from objective guardian to subjective maker of history through a re-evaluation of their foundational collecting and appraisal practices. <coughs> That the archive has come to represent memory, power, and truth, opening itself up to deeper investigation, is reflected in the understanding that archives are not neutral places, that they do not hold neutral records, and that they do not hold neutral records, sorry. If the archive has come to serve as society's collective memory, then the archivist has been imbued with a power and a status that must be balanced with a responsibility to acknowledge that not all facets of society are included in an official record, that there are gaps and inconsistencies in what has been saved for posterity, and that what is, not is in, what, and what is not included is as telling as what is, and that there is more than one historical narrative. This postmodern archival paradigm also acknowledges that the issues are not exclusive to the archive, but also to archive curators. The prominence of the archive has grown as other disciplines turn to it to solve their own questions of identity, memory, and power and the protective boundaries of the archive that previously supported a seemingly one-dimensional practice have dissolved and the archive has looked outwards to define its new and subjective proactive practice. What we see increase within artistic practice after an archival impulse, Foster articulates as a move to turn excavation sites into construction sites. However, he writes that this suggests a shift away from the melancholic culture that views the historical as little more than traumatic. But in this new archival impulse, where the archive itself has shifted and the gaps and missing voices are more prominent, can it be anything other than traumatic? What we see in some of these later archival works speak directly to trauma, and they are creating archives out of it. Um, Jeremy Deller's The Battle of Orgreave is both a performative reenactment of the clashes between striking miners and police in 1984. You can see here the video on the right of the screen and an installation of archival materials from all, uh, um, and an installation of archival documents and relics pieced together by Della. The archive collects material from all sides of the battle and includes union badges, police riot training documents, political memoirs, and books about the miners' strikes. It also includes annotated material from the reenactment, thus producing its own archive in and of itself. The Battle of Orgreave blurs the boundaries between the archive's status as objective documents on one hand and historical relics on the other. The use of historical trauma to construct archives can also be seen in the work of the Atlas Group and more recently in the work of forensic architecture. From an archivist's perspective, when acquiring into <coughs> major collections as artworks, the archival elements of these newer works become redundant, as the archive's basic principles can make such material readily available for research and interpretation. However, what we have been seeing at Tate is a newer, more archival archival impulse that is challenging not only these boundaries, but also the archival and museological methodologies used to define that which it produces. These next artworks are at each presentation or activation, actively generating their own archives as part of the work. So here we have Ian Kushmashram on the Barriers of the British Library. Each book um, has the name of a first or second generation uh, immigrant who has made a contribution to British history or culture. And using these screens and an online uh, space, the artist invites audiences to input their own stories of immigration that are archived as part of the work. Creating a new archive at each activation, these stories become a record of changing experiences of immigration, giving voices and space to experiences not captured in official histories. This one, um, Jose Mendoza's Brutalism is a model of the Peruvian military headquarters, and the sculpture includes inside it a, a computer which is programmed to search the internet for references to brutalism 
which are then printed out onto receipt slips that you can see here on the floor. Each activation creates a database, a digital archive of an alternative but joint history of Latin America, of architecture, of Peru's dictatorship past, and of the artwork itself via web mentions. Um, Pavel Altamar's film was acquired as a performance in a film, and um, the work is a 90-second trailer that is mainly shown in cinemas in, in, in anticipation of a 30-minute performance using the same actors. This version was created in 2007 for Tate, and upon acquiring the work, Tate also acquired a complete archive from its previous presentations, including documentations, drawings, storyboards, photographs, scripts. It's different at each activation, and the artist states that the archival material is for internal and archival use only. This implies for research or for reference, but it is unclear. In an interview with the artist and several of Tate's staff, they discussed placing it in Tate's archive, but no definitive answer was given by the artist. And so the material remains in the main collection with the artwork. And when the artwork goes on display, the archive material is, is not displayed. This, this film is produced, this performance is produced, but the archive material stays hidden in the main collection. So as an archivist uh, and a researcher at Tate, my main interests around these new forms of archival artworks lie with the questions that have been drawn out of Cuban performance artist Tanya Bruguero's practice, and especially her 2008 work, Tatlin Swiss for number five. This performance features two mounted policemen who use crowd control techniques on the audiences within the exhibition space. The acquisition of the performance included documentation from its previous presentations and states that the owner is responsible for collecting an archive of the work. Currently, all of the archive material remains in the main collection as part of the artwork and is managed by the time-based media conservation team. Its existence is not known outside of Tanya Bruguera's studio or the museum. The material is never to be shown in place of the performance. The performance must also always be shown. Um, let's see if this works. It, you can see it in action. Um, the performance is not to be announced or listed in advance to ensure that audiences do not immediately recognize that they are taking part in a performance. The intention is to invoke in them any memories of political unrest and protests or riots that may usually see mounted police. In conversation with Bruguera as part of her 2018 residency at Tate Exchange, she discussed how interesting it would be to reactivate the performance in the wake of any sort of political upheaval. She used Brexit as an example um, and she discussed the importance of the intention of the archive of the work. She explained that as the political landscape is changing all the time all over the world, it is important to make a record of such changes to understand and compare the before and the after between one place and another. In her practice, she demonstrates an expansive understanding of archival theory and practice beyond an archival intake and goes on to add, it's not going to be a very strict academic way of doing it but it will be another layer of archiving because you're also looking at how people react in 2008, how people react in 2020, and how people reacting in 2036 from all over the world. Um, we discussed her other artworks that generate archives, and she said about Tatlin's Whisper Number no. 6, Havana version, a performance at the Havana Biennale in 2006 that granted a temporary platform to free speech typically denied in Cuba. It is similar to a political perversion on my part to use archiving of my art to also remind people of historical events and to archive historical moments that otherwise are not being archived. Those interviews with those people don't exist anywhere else, but because the piece has been acquired, they have been saved. The work is to be recorded and added to its ongoing archive at each activation as well. However, previous attempts to activate the work in Cuba have seen the artists and her associates arrested. We don't know what happened to the attempts at recording those performances. Um, her statements about the intention of these archives speak to the changes in archival practice and the inherent power in the archive when considering who gets to write and be included in official versions of history. It echoes Derrida's thoughts on the archive that the control over the creation of and access to information is a tool of the state. Where Foster's definition of the archival impulse spoke to historicization, a looking backwards into the archive that we can see in Dean's work and the monument in Hirschhorn's, at Tate we are seeing the archive as a support for liveness and a system of active record making. 
This push towards liveness is something that is reverberating throughout the institution, who acquired their first performance back in 2005 and have steadily continued to add performance to the main collection. The ability to purchase the rights to and reactivate performance potentially changes both the museum and the artist's relationship with and the status of documentation. And if, it, if it is no longer a representation of the work, is it then the archive? Or does it become part of the artwork, as we see in Tatlin's Whispers number five and number six? A second type of liveness we are seeing entering is socially engaged and activist practices. Richard Bell's Embassy is inspired by the 1972 tent pitched on the grounds of Canberra's Parliament House by protesters demanding Aboriginal land rights. Bell, who describes himself as an activist, invites local groups to program events, talks and performances. For example, at Performer 15 in New York, Black Lives Matter and I Will Know More were invited to activate the tent. A joint acquisition between Tate and the Museum of Contemporary Art Australia, in, it is each institution's responsibility to collect material and documentation at each installation that will build an archive of solidarity and resistance that transcends national borders. In 2016, the Guerrilla Girls came to Tate to hold the complaints department. Keeping office hours, the Guerrilla Girls invited audiences to post complaints about art, culture, politics, and to hold open discussions about anything that they felt necessary. All of the material generated at each end of activation of this work is archived, and like Bell and Bruguera, creates an international archive and a record of a moment in political history. This turn towards live activist and participatory practice saw the museum open Tate Exchange in 2016 as a dedicated space to work collaboratively with the public and a series of so associates to explore where art and society meet. This is where the Guerrilla Girls hosted Complaints Department and where Tanya Bergera held her 2018 residency Tate Neighbours. The Tate Exchange programming is themed each year and for 2020 the theme was Power, which brings us straight back to the archive. <coughs> where Hirsch Dean, Hiller and Duchamp focused on a memory as a new archival trace, Della Shonabari and Bergera are actively creating new archives, addressing missed narratives and empty archives. They also speak to the archive as a metaphor for collective and societal memory, power and identity, but they acknowledge that both using and creating archives are political acts. Tate Exchange is now entering its fifth year and is looking to find a way that is archival yet unarchival to reevaluate the material that is being generated in this space and via these practices, including physical artifacts and immaterial traces. Calling on Alan Sakula, the unarchive also looks to the body as a repository of storytelling, dance, and other immaterial practices. And Reshaping the Collectible is asking Tate how it can make space in its collection and its institutional archive for these expanded counter archives. What can be learned from previous challenges to collecting practices such as performance works and the changing status of documentation, but also how to bring its archivists and record managers into the conversations with artists, curators, and collaborators to understand what they can take from archival practice and vice versa. If the idea and scope of the archive continues to be tested by other disciplines and non-traditional, hang on, sorry. If the idea and scope of the archive continues to be tested by other disciplines and the museum archive is to continue holding what is considered non-traditional material, and the care and use of these archives hold valuable lessons that can be extended out into archival practice and theory that I, for one, as an archivist, am excited about testing. I think that was super quick. <laughs> I'm finished. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a speedy paper. Well done. You win the prize. Uh, any Questions or comments, or shall we just move on and we'll we'll reserve them for the uh, the discussion? Maybe that's a better idea. We'll do that, I think. So thanks again. Okay. Great talk. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.